Well, Tattooed Millionaire um, was directed by a guy called Storm Thorgerson, um, who uh, obviously has a, a huge reputation as an art director for all the Pink Floyd albums, and, and I, I worked with him on a, a few things as well subsequently. Actually, funnily enough, later on in life, the Skunk Works album cover and the whole concept of that. Uh, he's quite an animated, imaginative chap. Um, I... And I suppose I'm going to get shot down in flames here. I don't think he's a natural video director. He is an absolutely astounding conceptualist and brilliant at um, set pieces. In fact, the wonderful thing about, you know, the Floyd videos, Learning to Fly, is that every single frame of those videos um, is, a, is a photograph. Is a, is a beautiful constructed photograph. But as a, as a, as a narrative teller, um, He's not that, that good. And in fact, during the filming of All the Young Dudes, which we get to in, you know, is the next video up, um, I actually went up to him during the shoot. I said, you're making this up as you go along, Storm. He said, yes, dear boy, don't, don't tell anybody, don't let on, you know. Uh, but Tattooed Millionaire um, and All the Young Dudes, I, I had a fair amount of input in, in terms of ideas and bits and bobs. And we basically wanted to have a, a series of sketches and I had the idea of um, using this uh, motif of a submarine, um, which was the submarine that was whizzing around, a bit like the yellow submarine sort of idea. This was a submarine that was always whizzing along, you know, watching everybody, little periscope popping up in all these little situations. Um, and so we took a fairly literal set of scenes from the from the movie. So there's the... Uh, the movie queen, uh, the movie queen who lives in shit with her rock star boyfriend. So we decided to, con we constructed a set which was literally uh, a living room full of shit. So it was about three feet deep in slime uh, with the coffee cup and the teacup and all the furniture floating in it and the rock star boyfriend floating in crap. She's the movie queen which we time lapsed. We did that in uh, in central London, I think, in Hyde, uh, Hyde Park Corner at night with her in freezing cold. I mean, it was like November or something when we filmed this. So we were doing lots of quick changes, sit in this seat for uh, a couple of minutes, sit in this seat for a couple of minutes or a couple of seconds, a quick change and, and everything else, and then chop them all together. And at the end of the whole thing, the chair tips forward and then she falls forward into this world of shit where... Uh, her rock star boyfriend is sat there wagging his finger going where's my tea and where's my dinner and everything else and you know and look at this dirty cutlery and look at this filthy plate you know and of course the fact that he's living in three feet of shit is you know he's just sort of unaware of that and and uh i think we had rubber walls uh on the the set or at least one of the picture frames was rubber so we did the old thing that we nicked from the the old tv series the prisoner where the, the big balloon, the big balloon rover comes bouncing along and you see this guy's face pressed up against the rubber. It looks kind of weird and strange. Well, that's actually my face in the video. I don't know if anybody's ever spotted it, but I'm actually singing the words as one of the portraits on the wall. But my face comes through the rubber on the wall and I'm mouthing the words to the song uh, in lip sync there. So if anybody notices that, it's, it's in there, you know. The same thing with the spoons on the ends of the noses in the... Uh, um, the the TV sort of game show, quiz show type sequence, which was Storm's idea. He was very keen on the spoons on the noses. Um, I'm not quite to this day, not quite sure why, but we spent ages getting the spoons on the noses. Um, he was He's a big fan of an artist called Magritte. So uh, uh, consequently, there are lots of blokes in bowler hats and top hats and things like that all lined up, um, which is a very regret sort of image. We shot some of that, uh, the masked ball sequence in there, which is in there somewhere. We shot in uh, Hackney, funnily enough. There's an old facade of this big sort of Greek temple tucked away in Hackney. Um, so we shot that there. It was a very expensive shoot. God, you know, the, uh, it was... Uh, back in the day, there was no expense spared on it, um, and that was it. And then, of course, we built the uh, the submarine set, which was our sort of little das boot moment. Um, what I originally wanted was uh, 
some idea a bit like the the gopher in Caddyshack that you would see this submarine sort of burrowing along the high street with little sort of um, like little worm casts following it as it as this periscope trundled along and we we investigated that but it would just have cost an absolute fortune it involved digging trenches and things like that so so we didn't do that so we ended up with just viewing things through a periscope and, and muggins downstairs. At the end of the whole shoot, um, I was, um, I said, uh, you know, this submarine, I said, what are we going to do with it? At the end, he said, oh, it has to go back to the prop house. I went, oh, darn, you know, because I was going to put it in my attic, you know. <laughs> so you'd have a, a submarine, on, submarine on the third floor, you know, which uh, never happened, much to my wife's um, pleasure, I think, you know. The idea of big, fat money men um, is always a soft target in, in, in vids, so it appears quite frequently. Um, uh, and funnily enough, I mean, when you look in the, in the, in the newspapers, um, they're always there in real life. You know, you don't have to look very far. I mean, there's, they're, they're all over the papers, as well as uh, whenever people get to view this DVD. But, you know, I mean, this week there's one all in the papers, you know, a uh, big, fat, bald-headed bloke, you know, chomping on a cigar with a mobile phone, permanently grafted to his ear, you know, um, doing a deal, you know. So th the idea is is that the Tattooed Millionaire was, was mocking people who use money to buy everything um, and people who's, you know lifestyles are completely fake and devo devoid of any any real humanity it's all just show and and no substance so that was you know and and it's viewed through the the sort of the, the cynical eye of the the bloke in his in his submarine all the young dudes was altogether much more problematical um, because um, we only did the song in the first place because, well, we needed something to, to stick on the record and I'd done it at a charity show. Um, I'd been asked to sing it at this charity show at Wembley Arena. Walked on cold and the, the lyrics were taped to the floor. And I did it, and I was quite surprised. I thought, hang on, it's, I didn't think I'd be able to sing that song and do a half-decent, you know, job of it, because the, uh, the Mott the Hoople version is, is such a classic. And what I ended up doing is actually singing it a bit closer to the original David Bowie version, who wrote it, you see. Um, and I thought, oh, well, that's, that's a great song that's not been around for ages and ages and ages. Maybe we could do that on the record, just see what happens. So we did, and of course it came out, and it actually was a hit in several countries. Um, uh, so we had to make a video for it. And unfortunately, I'm not a natural uh, dude. <laughs> you know, in fact, we had all the guys in the band. Um, uh, we had the, the drummer, Dickie Flizar, and, and the, and the bass, bass player. We're all much more like, hey, dude, <laughs> than I ever am. You know, so, um, and, and there's this great scene at the beginning where uh, um, Dickie turns to, turns to camera, just turns around the camera, you know, like, uh, you know uh, in the sort of the biker cafe scene that we have. And when he did that, we all look in the edit room, looking at that, and we all sort of went, we went oh, you photogenic bastards. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'd, I'd spend about six years trying to do a look like that, and Dick just turns around and goes, hmm, I went, oh, you good-looking swine. Uh, but it, so uh, uh, anyway, we had some fun with that. Um, it was a very simple concept because it was just, a, it was just an excuse to go and ride motorcycles um, and have a sort of a, a, a biker uh, a biker setup. Uh, it was actually filmed in a uh, a cafe which still exists in Soho. You you can go in there and um, you can go in into the uh, the the, the cafe in, in in Soho where it was shot. Um, we didn't have to bring in any of the decor. It's all there. Um, and still is. Uh, and then we went out to a uh, an airfield called North Weald, which is actually pretty close to where Steve lives in Essex, uh, on a freezing cold winter's day, where they lined up some old vintage uh, motorcycles. 
and um, I had loads of fun tearing around about 80 mile an hour up and down a, a runway on a on an old uh, Triumph Bonneville, uh, being a hoolie. It was snowing actually by the end, um, so I was absolutely knackered. I've got to say, and I was just wearing a pair of jeans and a leather jacket. My balls were so cold, <laughs> so that they were absolutely freezing. And I've got this uh, on the album, uh, on the uh, uh, not the album, the, um, the single cover. Um, I've got this awful, there's a, shots of me, they took a load of pictures, and I've got this awful grimace of pain, you know, on there. My face is like red and blistered and there's, you know, wind blowing like this. It was absolutely freezing. Lips were frozen, you know. It was really funny. But I tell you what, it was great driving it. And we were doing um, uh, passes whereby I'd pull up to the side of the car and then accelerate away, you know, um, being one of the dudes. And then the other one, we did shots where we were car was going that way, and I was going that way, and we 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 uh, sort of swapped ends, uh, which we did at a, a a very unsafe speed, <laughs> most enjoyably, I have to say, not on a public road. Um, and I, I can't recall I was even wearing a helmet. Um, I think I tried to get away with not wearing a helmet. It was so bloody cold. Uh, so yeah, that was just great fun. And at the end of the whole thing, we're playing in the old church. Uh, which is where I discovered Fuller's Earth, which is the stuff that makes you very dusty, <laughs> makes you very look like old and decrepit and dusty. Uh, so we had loads of it. In fact, I was coughing it up for weeks afterwards. Um, and we decided to bring back the submarine at the end um, with uh, the, the with the, the little boy who who, who represents um, innocence and a dude to be. And he comes up with a submarine just to remind you that the submarine's always there. The little submarine sailing around your subconscious is always there, always, always on the lookout, you know, um, from the last video. And, and, and of course, everybody went, what's with a submarine? <laughs> so I went, oh, well, never mind. <laughs>uh, what was then a video and obviously what's now going to be transferred onto DVD, which I think we call Dive Dive Live. Now, um, this was somewhat fraught because I, I had, uh, I had a, a concept which was at one end of the extreme, one end of the spectrum, and there was a big production company that got involved that all of a sudden had a somewhat different concept and uh, the two didn't mesh frankly and 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 they and uh, I don't think we ever got a satisfactory outcome uh, um, out of it uh, the, what I wanted to do was basically have something which is far easier to do now with much smaller cameras and basically uh, and, and have cameras all around the stage cameras in the audience and do a real jerky you know, literally from the audience, jostling, kind of just film loads and loads of stuff um, and get almost like a documentary style look. Uh, very, very realistic, really gritty um, of what it was like doing a club tour in America. Uh, not trying to pretend we were on stadium type things, you know. Th th there's, like when you see footage of home movie footage of, of, of The Doors or, or Guns N' Roses or whoever it is, and it's taken by some fan at, you know, Altamont or something, you know, or whatever, and it's jerky and everything else, and you see something, and, you know, it's compelling stuff, you know. And that's what I wanted to do. And I, 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 rather than do a big shoot in two days, I'd rather spend uh, two months with a, 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 a piddling budget but use loads and loads of stock and get great footage and then, and, and then just lay the music on the top. Anyway, this tosser showed up in Dallas and said, uh, oh yes, we've got the designs. I thought we'd have an urban set with lots of chain link fencing. Um, and um, I was in the middle of the tour and we were doing the shoot in two weeks. And I said, no, you can lose the chain link fencing. Let me guess, you want big pink graffiti? He goes, yes, that's, that's the sort of thing, yes. Lots of graffiti, darling. 
So we ended up doing the shoot in a, um, a place called the Country Club in Reseda in uh, California, which no longer exists as a venue anymore. Uh, and, and it was absolutely dismal. It was a venue with no atmosphere, with no drinks, and a restricted capacity. Because, oh, darling, we've got to have room for the Luma crane and the, the railway tracks, you know, and the catering trucks, you know. So that was it. Um, so they, they, they excluded half the audience to make sure that they had room for the cameras. This is a club show. And, the, and there was no support band because they couldn't cope with that idea. And there was no booze. So the audience turned up, sat there for two hours with all these people setting up cameras in sort of more or less silence. Then the lights went out and we walked on stage. It was dire. It was absolutely embarrassing. I was furious. Um, I actually went out into the truck afterwards and I said, do you have the tapes? And the guy went, yeah. He said, what? The, the, I said, no, the two-inch master tapes. And, because um, we played, uh, I don't think we played very well either. And uh, the guy said, yeah. I said, can you give them to me? He said, oh, yeah, all right. So I went out and I found a ditch full of water and I threw them in the ditch. Went back and sat in my truck. <laughs> and... This is the Merck story. And, yeah, and, and my... <laughs> And the manager came in and he said, he said, where's the tapes? I said, I'll throw them in the river. It's shit. <laughs> he said, do you know how much money we spent on this? I don't give a fuck how much money you spent on it. I didn't want to spend this amount of money on it. On it. Nobody asked me. You know, you went ahead and spent all this money. You know, he said, you want the tapes? You fucking get in the ditch. <laughs> he did. <laughs> Groffling around his hands and he's trying to find these tapes. <laughs> oh, dear. Oh, dear. I was a bit, oh, I, you know, I was a bit bad-tempered in those days, you know, a very intolerant sort of chap. Yes, anyway, it probably isn't as, you know, isn't as, uh, as, as awful as I, uh, as I remember it. But at the time, it was just a, t it was just a terrible experience. Uh, because the gig itself was so naff and we had had such great gigs on that tour we'd had some absolute crackers and and, and we were all we were all really depressed i mean all we all sat in the bus afterwards you know going to the next gig going god if only we'd have had you know been able to film stuff at like toad's place in new haven or some of these other amazing gigs that we'd done you know that, that was that were just steaming paint peeling off the walls, you know, red hot, you know, really, really cool. Um, but anyway, it was not to be. And we ended up pulling another two singles off the album, uh, Born in 58 and uh, Dive, 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 uh, which was basically comprised of e edited footage um, from uh, from the, the video and I think any other bits that they could cull together, any other little TV bits and bobs and things, um, they edited together to, to, to make to a sort of a composite composite video. But uh, it wasn't it wasn't terribly satisfactory. Uh, but it it it's 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 there as a you know as a as a, as a, as a document. There's no no getting away from it. Sometimes you sometimes you do stuff and it just <clears throat> doesn't work. You know. I still regret not calling that album "Laughing in the Hiding Bush," which was going to be my original title for it, and and I I, I just I got persuaded not to call it that, and I shouldn't have listened. But um, anyway, uh, "Balls to Picasso" it was, and um, uh, "Tears of the Dragon" was the 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 obvious, uh, you know, the 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 obvious track to do, uh, and it was a very successful track and did really well in a lot of countries. Um, I have to say uh, that possibly, well, not not possibly, uh, the most talented video director that I've ever worked with is Howard Greenall, who directed 
uh, Tears of the Dragon and Shoot All the Clowns. Um, and Shoot All the Cl and I'm going to talk about sort of both of them a little bit, but Shoot All the Clowns was 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 a bizarre song because it was stuck onto the back of the album after the album was finished at the request of the record company that in this odd story that I'll get into a bit later um, but what I will say about Howard is that the video we made for Shoot All The Clowns I think is ten times better than the track it was it was it, it was portraying um, and uh, so um, I love the video Shoot All The Clowns um, shame the song isn't a bit better you know uh, Tears of the Dragon on the other hand uh, just uh, I'm just continue I, I'm just blown away when I watched that um, it was it was thing of beauty Howard worked his socks off um, they had a long chat and you know I said what my ideas were for it the idea for the video was actually based on something I did when I was a kid at school which was when I, I adapted I directed a play uh, at school which was uh, a radio play called The Dark Tower by a poet called Louis McNeese and at the at, on the radio play obviously it's this this dark tower it's basically the quest if you like and they're all on a quest to find and the dark tower and at the end of the the uh, the radio play um, the uh, the guy goes well where is it and the guy goes, it's, it's that little thing there. He says, well, that's not very big. He says, oh, it's growing, look at it. And it, it grows out of the ground until eventually it's so huge. And they go, right, let's have a go at it then. And that's the end of the play. And all this kind of stuff that I was going through, having left the band and all the obstacles, difficulties, whatever, you know. Um, I thought, you know, this is one big lump, this big obstinate thing. Um, and so I built one for the video and it's this huge totem that sits in the middle of the sand um, which people are dancing around and there's this idea of you know you sat in a little circle you know of uncertainty and uh, th you know the big the big um, uh, the big sort of genie you know just you know blowing it's you know comp early computer generated stuff um you know just blowing you know chance and uncertainty around the winds you know um but it was all about fighting this this thing and what we tried to do and when we sh we shot it uh in two two locations one was out in uh in bristol out on a sat beach in bristol where it's one of very about two or three places in the world where they have an incredibly fast tide it comes in like a rocket this tide and um, so we put the set up and then we could you know rather than build a set and, and have it flood we thought we'll just put the set on the beach and nature will flood it so we only had a very short period of time when the all the, the water and everything else was running in in fact we very nearly lost a Range Rover <laughs> as it got sucked into the uh, sucked into the sands um, so we we filmed a load of stuff there uh we did we built the set on the beach uh we did the uh uh, uh howard's famous um what did we call her uh, feather lady you know uh, who's cropped up in a few of his actually he, he tends to use the same a lot of the same people in various videos and things like that you know so so how's howard's feather lady he's got a thing about birds um and uh, <laughs> so to speak <laughs> and uh so we used her and a cast of you know freaks and midgets and muscle men and big tattooed guys um i met the girls who'd worked on um all uh tattooed millionaire they they they, they reappeared in it uh, which was quite amusing chat to them again like, wow you know um, and uh, then we moved on to a place called Durdle Dur, which is in Dorset, down by Lulworth Cove Artillery Range. And it's got a fascinating, it's a 
amazing place. Um, it was this, and it was in April. And uh, this was the bit which involved me throwing myself into the sea, releasing the wave, let it wash over me. So it involved me splashing around in the sea in April. Um, it was bloody freezing. So on went the dry suit. And um, then we put the overcoats and things over the top of it. And I launched myself into the sea. And flailed around appropriately, lip syncing. Howard Blessing was in there with me, you know, with his, you know, with his camera. And we filled a load of other stuff up, up there by the cliffs. Um, um, the, and again, it was blowing a gale. Uh, we had to go up and down cliffs to go and do this whole thing. We filmed the the EPK, the Electronic Press Kit, which, you know, in other words, a bunch of interviews um, um, on the site. Uh, and uh, again, the last shot of the day was supposed to be um, this great big totem, which weighed, it was about 15 foot long and weighed a, a lot. Uh, and it's the big sort of spike that features in the in the middle part of the video where I'm bashing it with a piece of wood which incidentally the, well, the props man built this piece of wood as a sort of a cudgel that I would beat it with and it broke on the first hit um, so they got me another sort of broom handle or something and then I broke that after a couple of whacks so finally they sawed a branch off a tree and I beat that into submission and put myself in hospital for about a week afterwards I was beating the crap out of it so much and not too much anger there then so the, the final scene was supposed to be that as I was beating this thing, the sea would be rising up and um, I would, uh, uh, you know, be up to my sort of knees, ankles, whatever, waist in, 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 in sea. And then that was it. You just see the, the top of this thing disappearing under the waves, as, the, as you know, which was a nice image. However, <laughs> we got as far as the last shot of the day. Darkness was coming down. It was bloody cold we've been there all day and we tried to get this totem and maneuver it into the waves so there's about 12 of us all going right 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 hold it hold it hold it hold it hold it whoa and the bloody great wave came knocked this thing over sucked it out to sea right so this thing's now a hazard to shipping disappearing off into the channel whereupon it turns tail pointy in towards us and we're all standing in the surf going how are we going to get it back when it decides to come back of its own accord great big wave comes behind it things launching itself we're all running out the surf going ah, ah, ah it's coming to get us and, uh, but it was it was really comical we all fell about we were falling about on the floor laughing we all sat on the sand freezing cold we went okay that's it it's a wrap isn't it you know we can't do anything more after that Shoot all the clowns, as I mentioned. I had much more fun making the the, the vid than I did uh, actually doing the track. The track itself was was the most bizarre story. Um, uh, the 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 record Balls to Picasso. The album had been uh, passed on by uh, uh, what was then uh, Mercury Records, and i came back here and wandered into the office the management office down here in london and the guy says what are you doing on wednesday i said don't know he said you're going to la to make another track i went what why he said well we think that if you do him one more song for the album they might sign it i went that's ridiculous <laughs> i mean what kind of what kind of knobhead says something like that? You know, that's absurd. Like one track makes a huge, such a huge difference and I'm going to write it on Wednesday. That's absurd. He goes, well, that's what they've said. All right. <laughs> so I went over and I called Roy and I said, Roy, I said, look, <clears throat> we need to do a track, mate. He said, what sort of a track? I said, I don't know. He said, but you're around for a couple of days. He went, oh, yeah. I said, all right, well, we'll try and write something. I'm going to get some guidance on what sort of thing they want. So the guidance I got was a, a, a note shoved under my hotel room door with a cassette copy of Aerosmith Rocks, the album. And it said something like this. That was it. Something like this. So I phoned Roy. I went, Aerosmith Rocks. And Roy went, yeah. He said, well, that, that's all I've got. He goes, mm, all right. <laughs> so we go, go up to the studio. And funnily enough, the band called The Downset, who was signed to Mercury at the time and were, you know, they, they were big uh, sort of like rock rap guys. Good guys, but 
um, they're very much the sort of flavour of the month in Mercury at the time. And they were mates of Roy because he did a lot of the guitar on their album. They were in the same studio, so they're coming in, hey, what are you doing? And I said, well, I've got to write this song to try and get signed to your record label. And we sort of sat there in, in, in the lounge and he's going, you know, the, he starts on the riff saying, he said, that's all Aerosmith. He's like, yeah, that's all Aerosmith. Wrong. I'm thinking, okay, shoot, shoot, da, 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 shoot all the puppets, shoot all the things. And Roy went, shoot all the clowns. I went, yes. I totally agree. Shoot all the clowns. And we're thinking, line up all the clowns you can possibly think of on the planet. You know, not to mention anybody in a record company who would be a clown. I would think, shoot all the clowns. I think that's good. Right. Shoot all the clowns is what it's called. And we went and we recorded it that afternoon. And we sort of jammed it. And then halfway through the jam, we went, hang on, we've got another chorus, you know. Um, and the one a &R guy turned up. And said, how's it going? And the, the downset guys all came out and went, it's brilliant, but you can't hear it. <laughs> and he went, what do you mean I can't hear it? He said, it's brilliant, you can't hear it, though. He goes, but I've got to hear it. He said, no, you're not allowed to hear it. So he said, what can I hear it? <laughs> so we, we did that. And uh, we carried on making, the, making this, this track. And uh, then we had to go mix it. And... The idea was we, they were going to go mix it in this place uh, up in, 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 in Reno for reasons best known to the producer. So um, we had to get everybody up to Reno. Uh, and in fact, I think we actually flew them up there, uh, a little light aeroplane. We had some fun and, and, and flew the thing up there. Guitar amp in the back, guitar, you know, if we went to Reno. And I was supposed to be seeing this A&R guy on the West Coast who, who could sign the deal. So I said, so I made an, an appointment to see this guy, and uh, at the last minute the appointment was cancelled. I went, oh dear. He goes, no, no, he's he's really he's really sick. I'm afraid he's taken suddenly ill, but he really wants to see you, and he'll see you in a couple of days. I went, okay, well I've got to go to Reno and 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 mix this this record. So I'll tell you what, I'll come back from Reno and 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 come and see him in a couple of days. That'll be great. OK, bros, see you later. Bye. So two days later, I come back down. Oh, bros, he's been taking a terrible turn for the worst. He's in hospital now, and he's, he's oh, he looks really awful. He's, you know, he's, he's, he's on, like, you know, drip and everything, and he's really sick. He's not going to be better till Monday. Oh, OK, so I'll come back Monday then, shall I? Yeah, Monday will be fine, 11 o'clock. He'll see you. Great, so I come back at 11 o'clock. By now I've got the thing mixed. Monday morning I call up. Oh, Bruce, oh, you can't believe what's happened. He's blown up like a balloon. It's just awful. He's had a terrible reaction to the medication. He's just blown up like a balloon. Bollocks, the guy was in rehab. So uh, Monday night I flew to New York on the red eye and I get turn up at wherever it was, you know, Mercury Towers clutching a little dat with a little dat, saying, go on then, there it is. And all of a sudden, all these men in white trousers, never trust a man in white trousers, not especially not in New York, um, go and, go and, all in there, you know, doing their shaking hands bit, and it all comes out, and the guy comes out, and he goes, welcome to the label, Mr Dickinson. I guess we just didn't listen to it enough. <laughs> just get me out of here. Anyway, I was signed to Mercury for three months until they discovered that they, they had a huge... They had, they'd had they lost, like, umpteen million dollars and their boss company in Phillips came and said, you have to sack one-third of your roster. <laughs> so I was first one in, <laughs> first one out, you know. Last one in, first one out, that was it. But anyway, in the meantime, we had to do a video for Shoot All the Clowns because, because the Americans had, had said, we want this track. Yeah, yeah, and because we want this track, of course, it's a great track. <laughs> because, of course, it is, because they wanted it, so it is. So then they had to pay for a video for it, just to prove how much of a great track it was, because they wanted it. So I went, oh, fine, OK, Howard, you know. I said, look, I've got this mad idea. Um, shoot all the clowns. Um, uh, let's just make the whole thing about Don Quixote and Sancho Panza on a donkey, wandering around... Uh, the money men of Europe and Las Vegas and all the rest of it. 
And what gets a donkey going? A carrot. So instead of a, a lance, he's going to have a lance with a carrot on the end to get the donkey going. We'll have Alex on guitar, Sancho Panza playing guitar by the side of the donkey as we wobbling along. I'll be this mad Mad Max character and everything else like that. And Howard went great. He said we can we can go to the, we can do the Lloyd's Building. He said we'll, we'll we'll see if we can get the Lloyd's Building and get down there. We'll go through the square mile on this donkey, you know. Um, and uh, at the end of it, I said to, and I said oh, what I want is uh, 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 big slot machines. Loads of slot machines, and we want carrots everywhere. No money, there's only carrots. People are just playing slot machines for carrots. And at the end of it all, this little old lady just sits there and gets three carrots in a row, and suddenly the world is filled with carrots! And, like, oh, they're all throwing carrots everywhere. Uh, and we had a gigantic golden carrot, which I think I still have. You know, plastered parrot, golden carrot. So we set off to do this mad idea. And never work with children or animals. Donkeys. I was going to tell you, I nearly broke my back off these bloody things. Uh, we were on the mud shoot farm in um, East London, doing a lot of the shots with these donkeys, which is where we got the donkeys from. I used to work on the mud shoot when I was a student. So going back to this city farm was kind of funny, really. It's, it was quite amusing. And uh, I didn't realise that in order to get a donkey to go anywhere, you need another donkey somewhere in, in the distance. And this is a mother and daughter pair. And so you need one donkey to move, then the other one will move. But nothing, no power on earth will make this donkey go unless the other one goes. <laughs> and suddenly it'll go and you're off the back. You're like, oh, whack, you know. So we did all that. Then we moved the donkeys to the city of London. So I'm clip-clopping around the city of London with a, dressed, as a, dressed as a mad aviator with a, with a carrot on a stick in front of a donkey in front of the Lloyds building. It's dropping turds everywhere with a policeman. They're going, excuse me, you're going to clean that up, you know. Um, we did in not, in fact, to be fair, take a donkey onto the trading floor of Lloyd's. Uh, we pretended we did, but it was actually me going in front of the camera, you know, <laughs> Monty Python style, you know. <laughs> so Robin ran away, clip, clop, clip, clop, clip, etc. Um, so we did that, um, had loads of fun there. And uh, then we set up the rest of it and the carrots and the, uh, the big round table of all the money men doing all the trading and, you know, the greed and what have you um, uh, at the end of it. Um, and it was really rather fun to do, actually, that video. It was uh, quite straightforward. I quite liked it. And again, Howard did a great job, did a fantastic job at, uh, you know, pulling, uh, pulling a you know, very simple concept, but he did a great job on it. Uh, so I was, I was quite pleased with that video. As I say, the video I think is is uh, is, is vastly superior to the actual track that it it, it, it covers, you know. Um, but uh, hey, that was that was shoot all the clowns. By the time we got to uh, uh, Skunk Works. Uh, uh, I didn't have access to, um, uh, you know, the budgets that I, I had on on on, on, the, on the other videos I'd had before. But it didn't bother me because the budgets were so uh, over the top and there was so much waste, excess and stupidity that I thought I can do twice as much for half the money if it's done sensibly. So I decided that I I had a mate called Jeremy Aziz who was who ran a um, helped to run a studio called Little Bear down in Battersea. I went to look at the studio, and I said, and it had a swimming pool that they could shoot at next as part of it. So it had one big studio, and it had a swimming pool as a next door studio, and out the back there was a, a football field. And I thought, right. So I went to the record label who we had then, and I said, uh, what's the budget for uh, uh, first video? Decent first video, big first video. And I, and I think it was, uh, it came up with a figure, and uh, I said, sort of, I went, oh, okay. I said, add five grand to that, I'll give you two. I went, oh, well, how are you gonna do it? I said, don't argue, just, just you know, stick 5,000 quid on top of that, I'll give you two videos for the price of one. How are you going to do that? You can't do that. So, I said, no, no, no. so um, I said, Jeremy, I said, do you mind if I, you know, you produce it, I'll direct it. Um, and um, off we went. So we shot it in uh, sort of a day and a half. 
uh, with the usual constraints of shooting to a budget, which is just like, uh, we have to get it in this shot because there isn't enough film. We'll run out of film, we haven't got enough to do the rest of it, or we're running out of time, or we have to change this shot, we have to do that, or whatever, which is all kind of good fun. We had to saw a chunk out of the, uh, out of the roof to get the, uh, the, the gyroscope in uh, for uh, um, Back From The Edge. And the concept for Back From The Edge involved... Um, it was about childhood, partially, um, which is why we... And it was about how... The song is about how um, uh, what you know what happens when you're a kid. You you just seem destined to repeat the cycle. It's like um, uh, there's a line in the song that says, uh, "Like father, like son, in your bones it lives on, glowing shadows." You know th this idea that that family and genetics is like some sort of weird kind of radioactivity that just is in your bones, you know, and there's, 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 you know, there's not much you can do about it, you know. Um, and the song is that, so, so we had this initial image of, of somebody throwing themselves off the edge deliberately, but actually coming up okay at the end. So the first thing was, okay, we want to throw ourselves off the edge and we want to go into, ah, oh, let's go into some water, let's, let's, you know, let's go into some water and get sucked out. The idea was that we would build a, a in the swimming pool, we would build a child's bedroom, right, which we did. We, we constructed, there was a bunk bed and there's all kinds of kids' toys and things like that in the swimming pool, as it is empty. And then we would gradually fill it up, and as it filled up, we'd do lip syncing, and so it would appear during the course of the video that the whole thing filled up. And so finally, by the end of it, you'd be sat in your kid's bedroom, lip syncing away, and the whole thing would be flooded. And then you'd get sucked out of it, back from the edge. It turned out that wasn't going to work, because it would take so long to fill the blasted thing up. So we had to do it all in reverse. So we had to fill it up first and then drain it. So we actually ended up shooting the whole thing backwards. So we started off with a, a, a 30 foot, no, 20, it wasn't 30 foot, no, it was probably about a 20 foot tower and a load of airbags. So I jumped off the tower, jumped off the tower backwards into the airbags a few times, then flipped that forward. So I was being flying through space forwards. Then I jumped backwards into the pool, which the first problem was sinking. Um, so um, I got weights all in there, going down there and and then lip sync, we had a little speaker we dropped in the pool. And it is actually all, the opening line to the, 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 uh, the vid is one take, which the record company refused to believe. Nah, it's trick photography, isn't it? It's not. I said, you find the edit. There is no edit there at all. It's all one take. You can't hold your breath for that long. I said, it's one take. Trust me, it really is, you know. Um, and... Uh, so we lip synced it. We did two or three things, and and I think directing it was the, was the was the toughest thing because every time you came up for air, <laughs> you sort of sit there. There's a little monitor. You go, oh, look at it back. Ah, oh, bit more to the left this time then, oh, and then you go down and do it. Um, and uh, so uh, so we did that, um, and that was how we constructed the sequence. So I would I would f I, I fell in the water. And we flipped that round, sucked out of the water, flying through the air, land on the gyroscope, and we bought this big gyroscope in, and I did about 20 minutes whirling on this gyroscope, made myself thoroughly sick, um, and then discovered that none of the footage was any use. Because you couldn't really see what was going on, because what you wanted was a tight shot. So what we ended up doing was just going tight on the gyroscope, but I sort of hurled myself around like I was on a gyroscope like that. We went in and out, so this looks vaguely psychedelic. Um, and uh, by this time, the, the water in the pool had started to drain down. So we could go and do the bits with me, sat in the, uh, in the kids' bedroom, doing all that stuff. And actually, when we got it to the edit... Uh, when we got it into the edit suite at the end of the whole thing, we found that we were short of about, uh, oh, about um, 10 seconds or 15 seconds of decent footage, right? 
So we thought, oh, what can we do? So by the power of Avid, <laughs> we stretched it and just had me rolling my eyes and sped everything up in the middle and thought, well, <laughs> that just looks really weird, but it kind of works. Um, and uh, then at the, at the very end of the whole thing, we just decided to rip off the uh, Apocalypse Now bit, you know. <clears throat> Simultaneously with filming this one, we're also filming um, shoot all, uh, filming Inertia, which was the songs about the the trip that we did to Sarajevo in the war when we did the gig, and because the same band that we filmed the the vids was was uh, the band that that drove in to you know Sarajevo in, in in the middle of it in 1994 in the winter, and it made quite a profound impression on everybody. And Inertia is obviously the the resistance to movement and the resistance to movement in this case is the resistance to to to, to change from you know the, the 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 warring factions and you know um just letting history just endlessly kill everybody you know you know we'll we'll kill you because 600 years ago somebody killed somebody else you know so inertia was about that and um, uh, I wanted to have a, a dinner party with the four TV sets of the apocalypse. So we got four TV sets and we set them up at a dinner party. The idea was that um, uh, I would wander in through this big sort of Ken Russell, because what they had at the, the, the video place, it was a photography studio as well, so they had one of these curved uh, uh, backgrounds. So the whole thing was, was, was curved, the boards were curved. Uh, so I thought, great, just bring a bit of dry ice and smoke in, get a few fake limbs and things like that and stick them on there. And a, and a big guillotine, brought the guillotine in, got a fake head of me. And um, I self-guillotine myself. So I go in there, put my head on the block, pull that, boom, down it comes. My head flies off onto a plate, carry it in John the Baptist style. Um, uh, and laid on the table with the four TV sets of the Apocalypse all sat there, all with little swords like Sword of Damocles going over the heads of each one and I would then sing the song with my head on the plate surrounded by sort of serpentine worms and maggots and things which were very uncomfortable and I have to say very lazy um, it was incredibly difficult to get the, uh, the, the right sort of animated worms I, I don't think they're equity um, uh, at all. Um, so it's hard to get the worms to go. We tried various methods. Um, and the maggots were even worse. You know, and, for, for, and uh, you know, they're forever escaping. They sort of like go down your shirt front and you'd find them sort of nibbling away at your belly button fur and stuff like that. It's all quite yucky. So I spent um, several, a uh, couple of hours um, clamped with my neck in a table, um, lip syncing with worms being prodded every now and again. Go on, writhe, you buggers, you know. Um, uh, and uh, then towards the end of it, the idea is that, that this one of the swords that's hanging over one of the TV sets, so what we're going to show on the TV sets, we're going to be images of, um, you know, uh, pestilence and famine and things like that. Uh, uh, the, 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 the cable on one of the swords is, is, is fraying and finally thump, back in the tea set, TV set, TV set explodes. Little did I know what a palaver it is to get a TV set to explode, right? I said, what, TV set? I mean, you know, you put your boot through it and bang, bang, the gun goes, Whoa, no, you don't. We have to call in Mr. Exploding TV set man who comes in and it was like, you know, everybody dived for cover and I saw why. Because when he broke the front of this TV tube, covered in blankets and things like that, um, the whole thing is, is, is I mean, the glass is like that thick, and it's all stressed and designed with a big vacuum inside. You take the vacuum away, and the thing wants to explode outwards, even with no, with the air pressure sort of equalised. So this thing was, I'm, my head's on, on the table singing away, and I can just hear this creak. Ping, ping. And this piece of glass would fly out behind your head. You think, 
bloody dangerous, you know. So I could see why the guy was, was a bit... Uh, you can hire stunt TV sets that do, like, what they do on TV, where the guy throws a brick at the TV and it goes, flash, bang! But we didn't have the budget for that, so we had to do something else. Um, and... Uh, then at the whole, the end of the end of the whole thing, uh, the TV set goes up, goes up in flames. The whole table starts to burn. The gas burners merrily burning away, and all the dinner and everything else becomes just charred embers. Um, run outside of the football pitch, uh, uh, seat the four members of the band in the chairs, and just crossfade it. So it turns out, oh gosh, the band are the four members of the apocalypse after all. Mm. Okay, <laughs> but it was good fun and. Uh, you know, it looks, looks quite effective, really, I think, you know, for considering the, the budget and, and so on and so forth. So I had great fun making those two videos. What we did with um, Accident at Birth, uh, Road to Hell and, and Man of Sorrows um, was uh, uh, abandon... Uh, abandon the idea of a, a sort of a... a, a concepts or anything else like that and we filmed all three videos in the same day um, and we thought well we'll use uh, we'll use a lo we we'll use a, a, a great location and actually we used Battersea Power Station which had just been used for a big party for Arnold Schwarzenegger's um, oh god Batman they, they dressed it for this big Hollywood do for Batman and they were just taking it all down and we went for a recce on the site, and we, were, we had all these plans about using the, the, you know, the towers and the look and everything else. And it was just so big. Um, and then we went next door to it, and there's this smaller building, which was, I guess, some powerhouse or storage place. We went in there, and they'd used that to film... Uh, Kenneth McKellen's Richard II and I was just like there were bullet holes in the walls there was barbed wire still hanging from the gantries there was graffiti and stuff on the walls that had been put there it was industrial, there was chains it was dark and I was like oh, this is great I mean, who cares about the, the Battersea Power Station this is, this, is, this, is in, this is great this is what we want, you know, it's virtually the set as is so we just set the drum kit up we got a big wind machine in we got loads of flames loads of gas burners um and did two videos there just re just just redressing the set as it were um so uh i think uh, uh accident of birth was wind and road to hell was flames <laughs> And, and and you sort of go, okay, that, that, this is going to be very windy, so loads and loads of crap being thrown through the big wind machine at us and everything else, and um, and um, Road to Hell was flames for days. And whilst we were doing it, uh, we did uh, Man of Sorrows as a walkthrough with just me and Adrian. We didn't even bother with the rest of the band. We just did it as as... As, as, as just walking through the song and singing and we found some rooms that had broken windows so we thought great we'll just track the camera in there and me walking through and uh, and have a, a, a guitar in fact I think the, the the Battersea power station towers make a brief appearance in outside as Adrian's pirouetting spinning saying quick get the, get the. <laughs> that's what we hired the bloody place for quick get the chimneys in you know <laughs> um, so yeah so uh, so that was uh, that was how we got those three done uh, again. In, in I mean, in one day, uh, which is a really knackering day, but uh, it's the only way we could do it. Killing Floor uh, and the Tower again were two videos, which uh, for reasons of budget and all the rest of it, we decided to film on the same day in the same place. Uh, and it was all uh, a one-day shoot for both videos. Uh, again, we started to run out of time a bit for the tower, uh, which is why there's an awful lot of them chasing each other up and down stairs, sort of Doctor Who style, you know, lots of long corridors, you know, <laughs> uh, at the end of the tower. Um, but this was in a church up in uh, 
Tufnell Park, uh, which also doubles as a as a as a theatre, and it's a sort of a miniature, um, it's sort of an indoor version of the Globe Theatre. that was built by a, a, an actor, uh, and uh, exists there as a as a working theatre at the moment. And the guy who's the director was Julian Doyle, who directed uh, Can I Play with Madness for Iron Maiden, and is. Uh, very accomplished uh, filmmaker and editor. He did Brazil and uh, Time Bandits and all those films, edited them and Second Unit directed them and all the Terry Gilliam stuff. So he was a chum of mine and so we, uh, we'd we worked together on uh, several ideas when we were actually working on movie scripts together as well and we were writing together and things and uh, so I said, look, I said, do, do you fancy having a go at... at, at uh, shooting these couple of vids so we came up with some ideas and Killing Floor, the basic idea of Killing Floor which I, I sort of scripted um, was uh, the um, the Seven Deadly Sins so you were in you were in Satan's Cafe or Satan's Restaurant in which the Seven Deadly Sins take place at various tables and um, Satan is actually played by a, um, a hairdresser from Camden. <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, uh, very, very, very effectively as well, I think. Uh, and the rest of it, we just went through all the seven deadly sins. You know, I, I just uh, scripted little, little scenes. And uh, for uh, uh, gluttony, obviously, we had a reprise of... Uh, Mr. Creosote, uh, but in this case, I'm 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 the waiter, and and the Mr. Creosote character, you know, we're we're doing this little gag with the, you know, uh, you know, uh, one P. What any particular P or that particular P? What this one? What here? It's a little P, you know, no, just the one. And then he starts having to go trying to eat, you know, eat, eat eat the plate in my arm and everything else. And then the whole thing at the end dissolves into into a food fight, which was one take. We done it all and it was a scream i've never had so much fun on a video set in all my life lobbing spaghetti and everything else and getting covered in it was just great uh, adrian was the and we also I, I also appear in it as the uh, uh, the piano player during the food fight and adrian's the violinist um and uh, there's a couple of nice nice moments you know when the, the timing is just really nice as the lettuce comes flying over and adrian very elegantly sort of goes hmm just flies past, just carries on, you know, like the Titanic, you know, it's fiddling while it's sinking. Um, so there's, there's some really nice, uh, there's some really nice moments in that. It's, I think it's a very funny video. Um, and uh, Julian did a great job shooting it. And then we moved on to the uh, tower a uh, quick set change <laughs> um, and um, uh, we didn't have as nearly as much of a, uh, 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 an idea of what, what we were what we were trying to do with the tower uh, but the tower conjure, conjures up images of the tarot tower conjures up images of insanity and imprisonment and uh, uh, the hanged man and in actual fact we did get a gibbet and I decided that I would do do a sort of a human tarot thing where you hang up because the hang man when he hangs upside down it's got one leg straight one leg crooked so I was in a straight jacket one leg straight one leg crooked hang it hanging upside down from a gibbet for about 10 minutes trying to lip sync until I got very very dizzy and uh, they went it doesn't look any good because your face looks like a beetroot and I went okay I'll scrub that idea then <laughs> um, the sequences with the straight jacket are quite nice, which we just did with a pencil uh, light following me around. So I, I basically was flailing, put, got stuck in a straight jacket and um, threw myself around in a uh, what's supposed to look like a padded room, but actually wasn't a padded room. It was <laughs> it was very hard. <laughs> uh, and then we have the young lovers. So the whole thing is tarot. It, it, the whole the tarot thing, the lovers. Um, you know, d d death, the hanged man, all all feature um, in in the whole thing, and the fortune teller, and they they run away from the the scary freak that's pursuing them, and uh, Edison, the puppet, makes an appearance. Um, 
you know, so I'm sort of in there to, doing all the lettuce and operations and things like that and uh, and that was it really the tower's pretty straightforward um, I mean I think the tower actually is a is a is a better track than Killing Floor. Killing Floor's a better video than the tower. It's, you know, I, I wish we could get it right one day where we could get, you know, really great video to the best possible track. I mean, we did with Tears of the Dragon, I think, as well. Um, uh, obviously, that, that coincided. But uh, Killing Floor's a terrific video. Um, and uh, the tower, I think, less so. And we did run out of time on it. Uh, but I don't think it's as strong uh, uh, of a concept um, as, as, as Killing Floor.